The final reader for the first half is Lorna Crozier, whose, uh, whose work I have loved for years and years. I think I actually made a few poetry converts in my few years as a prof because I would read Sex Lives of Vegetables, <laughs> and my students went, what? I was like, yeah, sit tight, children. <laughs> You're going to learn a thing or two. <laughs> they could never believe that I, I was less embarrassed than they were. I always loved that. How can I be the least embarrassed person in the room? And, and you know much older than you guys. So, um, yeah, Lorna's not exactly one to uh, step away from, mm, from the risque and uh, the surprising. She's a whimsical writer, uh, but also one with um, such a true heart and a strong, strong voice. Uh, whereas Patrick uh, brings the West Coast uh, in, in his voice, what you hear in Lorna is the, the beautiful, flat prairie. Uh, because she's a Saskatchewan person through and through, and I'm sure that Victoria has not removed that. <laughs> Nothing can remove that. Please do welcome Lorna Crozier. It's a real honor to be here tonight. Um, I love coming back to Winnipeg whenever I get the chance to. And uh, it's been fun to be here with Patrick and renew our old acquaintances with people and with landscape. We went back and visited Louis Rial's grave today, and I found it extremely moving. The New Day. Across the eastern farmlands and into the city, light spills unimpeded. Now you can go into the dark that lives inside you. Even flies have a mother, a hard-won grief. Someone has taught them to wash and wash their faces until they shine. My last book was a book about common, often ignored objects in the world and also body parts. So I'll read a couple of those starting with fridge. Redeemer in the kitchen. The fridge saves everything that can be saved. Its door has weight. Few others except a vault shut with such solidity. By nature, habit, and intention, it likes its privacy. Perfect in posture, it contains two countries, one locked in early spring, perpetual and chilly, the other set in a northern latitude of ice and hoarfrost. It knows no change in seasons, no dawn or dusk. Undistracted by the ironic, the unrealized, all day it toils without emotion. Some believe it is a machine for manufacturing now. The food inside it eludes the future almost successfully. In the dark of the kitchen, its door open, it casts its light on Colville's naked man and woman who've come from the bedroom to get a glass of milk. At night, the rest of the house sunk in quiet. The fridge hums unpleasantly and sometimes trembles. Its dream is the dream of the dead whose bones can't shake the cold. bobby pins. The man who invented them adored his mother and later his wife. The proof is in the hours he devoted to preventing the hairpin from scratching the scalp. After many experiments with the family St. Bernard, he came up with plastic polyps the size of the head of an ant to cover the tips. 
Run your finger over them to see how finely they fulfill their purpose. What ingenuity, what premeditated care. He'd be the first to admit bobby pins are dull and unattractive. Still, he had an eye for beauty. Look at what they do. Expose a woman's neck, modestly reveal the delectable whirl of an ear. They're responsible for that intimate command, let down your hair. After, at least one of them goes missing. When it's found days later under the bed or inside the pillow slip, it carries love's rusted luster, that small ache. Feet. Oh, feet, to lyric nethermost to lyric twins, they are closest to the earth in all their doings. We go where they take us. Naked they walked us from the sea, our spine straightening, our gills slamming shut, the salt on our skin crusting in the dry air, our hands astonished into being hands and not another pair of feet. Simplest of mechanisms, yet they contain enough bones to construct the skeleton of a small lizard with some left over in the Make a Reptile kit. <laughs> when exposed, feet are more vulnerable than any other private part, more tender. If you fall for your beloved's feet, you'll never leave, though the arches will collapse, the bunions bulge and callous. The feet say more about the ungainly state of the heart than the mouth does, than the hands. To suck a big toe is the first and last infinitive in the body sutra of pleasures. <laughs> Maybe I'll read one more from here since uh, Charlene mentioned snow. And believe it or not, I miss it. Snow. How much snow and grief have in common? Their connection with the seasons, their silence, their slow accumulation. Consider the woman who, sensing the hush of the first snowfall, gets out of bed in the early light of morning and pulls a man's loafers from the back of the closet, pulls on her boots and parka, and steps outside. Placing her hands inside his shoe, she bends, plants his footprints next to her own, straightens, takes another step, and does the same thing again and again, all the way from the porch to the garden gate. There, she stops and looks back, his tracks beside hers. She has matched the drag of one heel and the longer stride. The snow briefly holds them, then, impeccably falling, fills them in. I'm thinking you can't be a Canadian poet if you don't write a poem about a moose. <laughs> Every province has them, I think, right? So I'm writing about the moose nose. It's the most orbicular, the biggest nose of our country's ungulates, mimicking as much as anything a crook neck squash, the one that won the ribbon at the country fair. The moose is so powerful, his singular is plural. Yet when you come upon him at the edge of the forest, his nose relaxes you. It makes you laugh. It's as if the craftsman assigned to the task had never made a nose before. <laughs> as if the moose was his first try. And after that, he was demoted to construct the scrotum of the sea lion. The toenail on the homo sapiens big toe. 
It's so risible, so homely. We call the biggest, thickest, tight end on the football team Moose. Though in truth, he studies poetry at NYU. And John Ashbery chose him as his only undergrad. If you are still chuckling, schnozzle, conk, bulbous baboon, take another look at the beast you've come upon, who is looking at you, who is thinking. A great tree grows out of his head, a tree where no birds rest. And the wind, though it can smash a granary into the ground and levitate a tractor from field to field, can't budge those branches. Moreover, the tree is rooted in the moose's mind, a northern mind, a swamp mind, a mind of huge imaginings, so complex. Samuel Beckett and Virginia Woolf Wait in line at dusk for his office hours so they can have a chat. And I'm going to conclude with two poems about growing older and all of the worries and delights that that brings. Late dialogue. If, he says, if what? she asks, if bird, if rain, if fire, where, she asks, if you, if me, if Tuesday, if Tuesday, if fist, if meat, if wasp, if blunt, if shovel, if want, if want, she takes off his glasses, kisses his high forehead, dips her finger in brandy, and runs it along his lower lip. If yes, she says, if do. Um, As Charlene intimated, I've, I've written a lot of, I guess, risque poems, a lot of poems about desire and sex in the body. And uh, I thought about five or so years ago, maybe a little longer, that I'd stopped writing erotic poems and wondered what that was about. So I'm going to conclude with this one. My last erotic poem. (laughs) Who wants to hear about two old farts getting it on in the back seat of a Buick, in the garden shed among vermiculite, in the kitchen where we should be drinking Ovaltine and saying no. Who wants to hear about 26 years of screwing, our once not unattractive flesh, now loose as unbaked pizza dough, hanging between two hands before it's tossed? Who wants to hear about two old lovers slapping together like water hitting mud, (laughs) hair where there shouldn't be, and little where there should, my bunion foot sliding up your bony calf, your calloused hands sinking in the quick slide of my belly, our faithless bums, crepey, collapsed. We have to wear our glasses to see down there. When you whisper what you want, I can't hear. But do it anyway. And somehow get it right. Face it, some nights we'd rather eat a Hagen dazs ice cream bar or watch a movie starring Nick Nolte, who looks worse than us. Some nights, we'd rather stroke the cats. Who wants to know when we get it going, we're revved up, like the first time, honest, like the first time, if only we could remember it. (laughs) Our old bodies doing what you know bodies do, worn and beautiful and shameless. Thank you.